There we go. There we are. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. This is Ann Carey Ford welcoming you to John McIntosh Q&A. Uh, what's really going on with a bunch of question marks? <laughs> uh, today's topic is um, shake up to wake up. And uh, that should be interesting. Uh, we're going to keep the broadcast as usual at about 55 minutes long. And if you have questions as we go along, please put them in the comments to the right of your screen if you're joining us live. Uh, if you're not joining us live, if you're watching a replay, uh, I want to mention that the replays of the, the last Q&As are at a, at a particular link that John's going to pop up now. There it is. Uh, and you can go back and watch them if you're so inclined. And if you have questions during any of them and you want to reach out and ask a question, you can email John at globalpeaceweb at gmail.com. And uh, perhaps your question will be chosen to be read in a future broadcast. So just to introduce myself, no, I didn't get my hair cut. I, it's, it's up in a, like a kind of a bun. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm not as fuzzy as I usually am, but thanks for, for noticing. Uh, I'm Ann Carey Ford. I'm calling in from Ojai, California. And um, I've been exploring this time that we're in right now, the shift, I call it. Uh, and I've put some of my insights on voiceofdivinefeminine.com, which I cordially invite you to um, check out that website and please reach out to me with any insights uh, or observations that you might be having. I'd love to connect with you. So I think that most people are familiar with John McIntosh. Um, here's a link where you can find some of his books, his greatest hits, I like to say. Uh, and um, I don't think he really needs much introduction. I'd love to bring him on now, though, to um, say a few words before we get started. Thank you uh, so much. Um, we're going to, uh, uh, first of all, welcome you to our 14th uh, broadcast. Um, this will be a kind of an expansion of uh, the theme. I think it was the rising storm or something like that that we called last week. It's, it'll be an expansion of that. And um, what um, um, Anna is going to do is, is um, uh, read a few bullet points on what theoretically is really going on in the world right now um, with the, the rising storm, uh, which which um, we call a, sh a shakeup. Um, and then she'll comment on it in her own way. Um, and then when she's done, uh, turn it back to me and I'll comment um, on it as well. Uh, and then we'll go into the questions. So I'll give it back to, uh, to Anne and she'll uh, handle that part of our broadcast. Great, so this is um, entitled Shake Up to Wake Up, some notes. Without saying all or any portion of what follows is or isn't true, here is what looks to be happening. A worldwide pandemic that actually may not be a health crisis at all. The CDC, the Center for Disease Control, which is a globally recognized authority, downgraded the virus to the level of a flu in March, and a few weeks ago said that only 6% of reported deaths were directly related to COVID-19, so it's obviously not a pandemic if this is true. The media has not reported these official statements at all, although it is available on the official CDC website, although you may need to dig for that information. This has resulted in cities and businesses being locked down, financial ruin for many people, social distancing, wearing of masks that reduce oxygen intake, increase carbon dioxide and compromise the immune system and do not spread, do not stop the spread of viruses according to the printed information on most mask packaging and also according to many professional medical sources globally. There is a proven remedy proclaimed by medical doctors all over the world with hard evidence of its efficacy that is FDA approved for over 60 years, yet is illegal to prescribe despite having saved untold 
thousands of lives by doctors who have risked their careers to give it to their patients. Riots are occurring in many countries, maybe fueled by vested interests. Protests and gatherings that are illegal are occurring in the thousands all over the world. Again, not reported accurately by the media. There is uncertainty for most people about where all of this is leading. Okay, for those who are aware of these things, there's often outrage and many live in constant fear and anxiety as they direct their attention outward to the story and drama of this situation. The question is, what should so-called someone do about this? So John has asked me to share some of my own thoughts about what someone should do about this. And um, I think that there's two ways to regard this current situation that we all find ourselves in, a relative and an absolute perspective. So the relative perspective observes this chaos, this obvious chaos that's stirring up the, what I call the shadow side of the collective. It's almost like a collective purge of the dysfunctional systems that we used to consider normal, normal with quotes around it. So chaos creates fear because fear is the natural reaction of going into something that's not known, the unknown. But this chaos could also be considered as an opportunity for transformation. So in nature, this is as exemplified by the caterpillar turning into the chrysalis to emerge as the butterfly. It has to completely dissolve as the chrysalis. And that means it's, it, it goes into that nothing. It's just actually disappears as the chrysalis. So I think that's the, the stage that we're in right now is the chrysalis stage. So however one considers the particulars of the situation that we're in, the reaction of fear is actually disempowering. It, it in, inhibits clear decision-making. It keeps one from asking questions, from being curious. Uh, we want to resort to the known, but we're in a very unknown situation. So fear is natural, but it actually inhibits our ability to um, to have have a clear um, and conscious response. So if one remains open and relaxed and curious, uh, I think it creates a state of compassion for everybody, including the enemies, quote unquote enemies, the people who are causing harm, the people who are causing division, the others that are doing that. So however one regards the situation, we, out of compassion, naturally want to help. We want to help. But I think the, the key point about being effective and helping is to have a, a, a skillful means. Uh, what do I mean by skillful means? How to be effective in helping so-called others. I think that the best way to be effective with uh, skillfully effective is to stand in your own truth, to emanate your own um, essence of love and let that energy speak for itself to, to uh, emanate your natural state of being, which I believe is love. And that creates a space to be able to listen to other people, to really be present and listen so that you can effectively speak into their listening. It can help raise a question, maybe a, a, a I kind of look at it like a little cartoon question mark over, over their head to just look for an opportunity to really connect with their own curiosity, with their, um, question, their possibility of questioning their own beliefs so that the whole situation isn't so solid. 
And that's possible when you're open and relaxed and centered and yet very unattached. So if and when fear arises, it's helpful to step back and look at the bigger picture of this collective purge, I like to call it, and how immensely challenging that is for everybody. But I think that the purge was absolutely necessary to disrupt the um, collective habitual concepts of how things used to be that were absolutely dysfunctional. And that disruption, the, the disruption that we're experiencing now is extremely um, necessary to disrupt the systems that were not serving us. It's gonna give us an opportunity to recreate how we cooperate, how we exchange, how we appreciate each other uh, completely, totally so that we can move into a more functional, loving and equitable way of living on this planet. So this bigger perspective permits um, more patience and more um, tolerance for the others, but also for um, any kind of hardships or inconveniences that we might be experiencing personally. And I also think that it's uh, opportunity for modalities like meditation, true meditation and contemplation uh, to be um, practiced, provide more groundedness, more centeredness, more objectivity, so that the collective, as the collective may become more off-centered and more stirred up, we can, um, we can find sanity in ourselves. Maybe I'm stating the obvious. That's the relative um, viewpoint as I see it. Now, the absolute perspective, you could say, is to regard all of this as the dream that it is. And it's a very detailed, <laughs> multifaceted dream, <laughs> uh, very all pervasive. Um, but it's, it's a hologram, it's a mirage. So this is, for me, a complete shift in perspective of so-called reality. It's a, it's a perspective of, of uh, unity, wholeness, oneness. The I am, the, I am all of it. Everything is me and I am all of it. This perspective, in my experience, has has come about quite quite naturally on its own. And I think it's uh, prompted by one's um, investigating who, who am I really? What is the nature? What is my true nature? And what is the truth of my experience in life? Uh, and, and having that open curiosity, that relentless um, pursuit of the truth uh, consistently and wholeheartedly, relentlessly, uh, then one can experience a, what I might call an initiation into the, the, the truth of the joy and the freedom that is unconditional. It isn't dependent on this or that. Uh, the perspective of the absolute is actually a um, sense for me of pain and pleasure arising together in all situations. The, the, the this and the that of it merge into just one experience of now, the now that is. And um, that initiation is the process of waking up to one's true nature, which seems to be um, the order of the day, if, if one is up for it. <laughs> I don't know if that made any sense or not, but that's my, um, that's the observations that I wanted to share. And John asked me to, um, to give my own perspective about that. So 
There it is. Well, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Anne, for for sharing the ongoing um, awakening uh, that's obviously occurring, uh, and I feel that um, there probably will be many uh, that are feeling very similar in their own unique way um, with how the the uh, shaking up of the world and of their individual lives um, is influencing. Um, the real life, which is the inner life. Um, one of the things that this touches on, uh, which we've talked about a couple of times now, um, is uh, the first part of, of awakening. There are three parts to awakening. And the first part, uh, which is happening globally, not necessarily with everyone, uh, because many people are still in denial. Many people are comfortable with the uncomfortable. And it has to become extremely uncomfortable before uh, there is a questioning of the status quo, especially when that status quo is not consistent, which it isn't. You see the up and down of uh, political figures. Um, you see the up and down even even of uh, health care and, and um, uh, medical um, um, authorities uh, saying one thing uh, one day and the next week they say something different. Um, so this creates a kind of a confusion that leads to a questioning, and the questioning is what's really important. So in the first phase of awakening, just to repeat uh, what we've talked about before uh, in this regard, there is an awakening from the status quo of how reality, how the world works, how it is working, um, to what actually is happening or at least to the awareness of the fact that it doesn't look like what I have believed all my life is actually what's happening in the world. There are some things under the surface that seem cons considerably different than what I believe was true. And uh, this is a, a, an extremely valuable phase of one's um, awakening from the deep sleep uh, of the dream. The, the next phase that this can lead to, and it can lead to very, very quickly, once the questioning is, my God, this world doesn't seem the way it is. I, uh, what am I doing? Am I hallucinating? Am I hypnotized? Am I dreaming? This question will come up. And at that stage, there becomes an awareness, um, uh, and it's a mental awareness. Uh, it's a thought. It's a belief that, uh, yes, this world is a dream. But when you go out into your day-to-day -day life and perform your day-to-day -day duties, which are more confined and in many cases restricted, so this allows for the possibility of slowing down the mind so that you can actually look in more detail rather than constantly being distracted because you're not as busy. <clears throat> you may want to be, but the circumstances are putting you in a corner so that you have this opportunity to, to go within. And, and so very quickly you can shift into this belief that um, this is a dream. And then when you're busy, uh, you forget about it and you just fall back into the dream. So it's a kind of a ping pong of being in the dream, forgetting that it's a dream, and then stepping out of it and being quiet under whatever circumstances and feeling like, um, oh, this is a dream. This doesn't, uh, this, uh, yeah, this is not real, but it's still mental. And, and that can last a very long time in terms of clock time. And when I say long time, I mean lifetimes. And it has uh, lifetimes uh, reincarnation, as I've said before, is true, but only within the dream. It's not real, but it, it appears to be real within the dream. Finally, what happens when the level of frustration, which is happening right now for most of humanity, there are enormous amounts of frustration. And as, as Anna said, fear, uh, which confuses and disrupts and upsets and causes uh, physical anomalies that perhaps you haven't had or exacerbates ones that you have. Um, it puts you in a position where uh, the questioning goes deeper. And at some point, uh, there is an awakening that shifts the, the belief uh, that this is a dream into the knowing that it's a dream. And that, that's when you become heart-centered. That's a knowingness or an aha, an epiphany, and satori that comes from the true self, from the self in capital letters. And, and all of a sudden, you wake up to the fact that this isn't real. 
You may have believed it for a long time, but now you know for sure it's not real. And I've said many, many times, but it bears repeating, now you're free. But you're free with baggage. Whatever the conditioning is that has held you captive within the dream is still clinging to you. It can be like a backpack. And, um, and it's loaded with, with attachments to various things. Uh, 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 it's loaded with uh, expectations of various things. It's loaded with identifications of various things. And in fact, the more mental you have been, for example, uh, someone who is very educated, um, and has a number of degrees and has used those degrees to navigate in the dream will find it extremely difficult to let go of the identification of I am this or I am that uh, related to perhaps and probably in some way related to their to their education. So the more mind stuff you have, the more knowledge you have, the larger your library of knowing uh, from a factual uh, uh uh, standpoint uh, you're experiencing, the more difficult it is to let go of identifications. You know, I am this and I am that is identifications. And uh, these things are all tied to your memory and they're tied to your imagination. Uh, and, and your memory and imagination is actually fostered by the world, by the dream. It encourages you uh, uh, through sentiment, for example, uh, music and, and uh, novels and movies and, and um, uh, family discussions talk about, oh, I remember when. And this actually expands as you become older. When you're less active, you're, you're living more in the past um, when you're dreaming, when you're deeply, unconsciously dreaming. Um, and then imagination is very much a part of what's encouraged, uh, even in education and certainly in, in self-development circles, um, as a way of, of creating your dreams, as they say, which is absolutely true. You're not really creating them. You're, you're projecting on the screen of consciousness uh, a concept, an idea, a thought uh, that then manifests, possibly manifests, depending on your passion, uh, into some sort of uh, an experience that people call reality, but it's not reality. It's just another dream. So you are manifesting dreams out of your imagination based also on accumulated facts, uh, which ties into your attachments, your expectations, uh, and your identifications. This is the conditioning, the package, the baggage, as I call it when you're free, of conditioning that manufactures the personality, the persona, the identity of who you, meaning anyone, has called me. And uh, this is what's being shaken. This is what's happening in the world, and it's not an accident, and, and, and there are no perpetrators. Uh, they're just actors on the stage playing a part in their own conditioning, believing that they are this or they are that. Perhaps they believe that they're superior to others for whatever reason and that they know better, and that, uh, let's say, a, a, a one-world government or society, I think they call it, um, is a better way, uh, uh, led by whoever me is in that, in that case, whatever group uh, this is. Um, and, uh, and they actually believe this, that they're, they're the good guys. Uh, and, and all they're doing is reading a script based on their own conditioning. Uh, they're dreaming extremely deeply, uh, as are others. Um, it's all part of a phase, which I called before the divine dysfunctional, divine masculine patriarchy, which has, has now stopped. It's finished. It finished a handful of years ago, and we've moved into the age of light, which we'll call the neutral phase, where uh, the divine masculine and divine feminine are basically moving into a balanced period of a couple of thousand years, also in a dream. And... For many, there will be the opportunity during this phase, let's say during your so-called lifetime, the lifetime of the body, not the lifetime of you, because you have no lifetime. You are eternal uh, as the self. But during the, the so-called lifetime of the body, when the self that has been sleeping within the body that you're wearing has this opportunity as we, we move out of this dysfunction, which is peaking now uh, all around the world, and into a highly we'll call it functional, neutral um, phase, there, there is a unique opportunity to move from I believe this is a dream to I know this is a dream, 
where you move into the front row of the theater um, and you are uh, consciously, actively involved in dissolving the baggage that is still dragging you back up onto the stage um, periodically, back and forth, back and forth. And that even happens when you're in the echo stage halfway up the theater. It doesn't happen in the whisper stage at the top. Um, this is what's happening now, not for a handful, as it has for hundreds of years, but for millions. And soon it will be billions of people that have moved into this is a dream, to I know this is a dream, to I'm free with baggage. Um, so it's, a, it's an incredible uh, moment, a, a great shift, as, as I call it, a divine shift. Um, and it's very, very scary for a lot of people. But, but let me assure you, this is, without any question, the most significant, greatest blessing that has occurred on planet Earth for the sleeping masses, which really represent only the self that seems to be many, uh, sleeping in many, many disguises. So take heart. Um, uh, this is a wonderful time to be present on the planet. And um, uh, to the extent that you're able to um, share um, with others your, your feelings, and, and certainly if fear comes up, if chaos comes up, um, if w what seems to be uh, insanity comes up, to the extent that you can, allow it to play out. Obviously, it's better to play out on your own or certainly in the, in the, the presence of those that, uh, that are loving, um, such as a family that understands. Let it play out. Watch it. Uh, but watch it from uh, the audience as a witness. Allow it to play out. Say yes to it um, and, instead of resisting it or trying to suppress it because it'll just come up again, only it'll come up even stronger because what you resist persists. I'm sure you're familiar with that statement. Whatever you place your attention on with passion becomes greater. That's mm -hmm. what it really means. So this is the opportunity that exists. Uh, it's expanding, um, and it's expanding through a lot of activities that are going on in the planet right now that are clearly nefarious, um, that are not honest, uh, that are not telling, telling you the truth, um, and uh, uh, exemplified by um, a, uh, a communication system called the media. Um, that is clearly uh, owned and operated by these nefarious concerns. But they're not bad guys. They're all part of the great shift that's occurring. They don't know they are, uh, but they are accentuating the chaos so it comes to um, a breaking point um, uh, and a meltdown, uh, which is very imminent. Uh, and this is all extremely so-called good. I don't talk about positive and negative, bad and good, because both of these things are part of oneness. Um, but it'll appear like a very, very good thing when it bursts. And uh, just hang in, because uh, without any question, uh, you're living in a very, very auspicious moment uh, in the dream uh, for your own freedom. So let's turn it back uh, to um, Anne, and she'll give us the first question here. Great. So the first question is from Sridhar, who asks, regarding the grand dream, is it the primordial urge to experience life in a more tangible and solidified way, even though it's an illusion? And does not that urge in some way arise from the self? Okay, now we have talked about this before, but it, it certainly bears repeating because it, it really, <laughs> The question really is, uh, what's life all about? Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's can be asked in a hundred different ways, thousand different ways, but but it, it simply means um, uh, what the hell's going on? Um, and um, so let's let's go back to uh, what we'll call the absolute. I don't use the term absolute because it's not something that can be explained at all. Uh, the absolute um, is absolute nothingness or emptiness. It doesn't know itself. Um, but there is an urge, and, uh, and I'm, I'm using words to describe the infinite, so they're not accurate, but as close as possible. There is an urge to know itself. So it uh, manifests a thing called consciousness. Consciousness comes after the absolute. Uh, consciousness is also called the self. It's called I am, um, and uh, a number of other names called God or Allah or uh, Buddha or uh, 
thousand other names, um, but certainly God or the self or consciousness are, are very well known names. And uh, it is on the screen of consciousness that uh, the, the idea of separation um, first occurred. And this is a necessary aspect of the manifestation of anything because you have to have a from here to there phenomena, which involves time and space. And, and time and space allows the distance to, to say from my eyeballs to the tree. Um, it takes time to get from, from my eyeballs in this body to walk over to the tree. So that's time and space. And um, so multiply that times the myriad number of activities and uh, things that exist in the universe and you have a manifestation of separation and it's an illusion it's a manifestation and it's temporary and anything that's temporary doesn't really exist but since it's a manifestation of the self it also exists so this is a di divine dichotomy it exists but it doesn't exist then the self steps into, consciously steps into its manifestation or its illusion and forgets who it is. And in that forgetting, it's like going to a movie before you read the book. You get to experience everything as if it's fresh and new. You forget that you're God. And that way you can experience the dream as if it's real. And this is where the vast majority of, of uh so-called people, there are no others really, there's only just the one in, uh, appearing as many, but the vast majority of humanity is right now is the belief that this is real. And this is the self slumbering, as I call it, the divine self or God self slumbering in its own projections, its own manifested projections that came out of separation. So most definitely to answer that question, um, it, the self has chosen to create, and it's not creating because creation is eternal. It's manifesting um, a, an illusion so that it can play within it, taste itself, savor itself, know itself uh, for a season. And the season, of course, is, is eons in clock time, also an illusion. It's all happening now, and it's actually not happening. Another di divine dichotomy. It's not happening. It never happened. It isn't happening. And uh, it's not real. And yet it is. So uh, there's no explanation for that. It's just it's happening, but it's not happening. And most of humanity is, has been in bondage, in prison, stuck in the illusion of something that's not real in order to experience itself. And that experience is being experienced as a full swing of the pendulum for what people will call dark to light. Um, uh, within the illusion of the universe, which includes your own personal experiences uh, in your day-to-day -day life. And, uh, and that's what the dream is. That's why the dream exists. And ultimately what happens and is happening right now is it moves into a phase where the self, at least a large portion of its fragmented uh, entities, returns to the full awareness of the fact that it is the self or God. And for most, that means it will leave the, the shell, the body, the temporary entity or vehicle it uses to navigate in the, in the universe. Um, but some, like myself, um, I'm still here. I don't need to be here, but I'm still here. And there are uh, a number that are. Um, I'm no different than you. I'm no different than anyone. I'm just fully aware that I am the self and I live as the self always. Um, and so some, certainly many, uh, at this time, because of the shift, um, live in that state. Um, so hopefully that answers the question for you. The next question is from Nirvana, who wants to know, how do nighttime dreams relate to the awake dream? Okay. Um, this is a, a question that for certain you've asked, if you haven't, you will. Um, uh, or you have asked in the past and it's been answered for you. But the, the, the simple answer is the dream that you're living uh, that, you know, apparently is happening right now as we communicate with one another uh, seems to have continuity. Uh, you go to sleep, you wake up and, uh, you know, your, your bedside table is still there. Uh, your, your, your bed you're sleeping in is still there. The 
the, the light uh, on the ceiling, if you have one, is still there. Um, uh, the house is still there. Uh, your job is still there, hopefully, um, uh, or not. Uh, your car is in the driveway or in the garage. Uh, you know, your children, your family are still there. You know, there's a continuity, um, although it's being heavily shaken right now, uh, as we talked about. Um, in a nighttime dream, um, I don't know if you, uh, if any of you have seen the movie Inception with, with um, I believe it's Tom Cruise. Um, but uh, in it, he's talking to um, someone he calls an architect that building dreams um, and that they step into. A uh, beautiful analogy. Uh, and he's asking uh, this uh, happens to be this, this uh, young lady. Um, Do you remember how we got here? They're sitting, I think, in a cafe in France or something like that. Um, and he says, do you remember how we got here? And she can't remember because she thought it was real until that moment. Um, and, uh, that's exactly what happens in a nighttime dream. You just kind of show up wherever the dream begins and the dream might be long. Uh, of course there's all kinds of discussions on how long dreams actually are, but let's say it feels like it's all night long and it can go into episodes like a saga. And you may remember all of it as it's this big, long story that has continuity, but it also ends kind of on a dime and not necessarily with a, a, a conclusion. It's not like a real story that has a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, so your nighttime dreams do not have continuity, although it is possible to have the same dream over and over again um, or, or even to pick up a dream um, uh, at another sleep time and, and um, continue it. That one's far more rare, but it does happen. Um, a nighttime dream is, a, is ostensibly no different than your daytime dream. It seems different, but it is. It's a, a dream is a dream is a dream. And it's based on the conditioning that you have. Very often it's based on um, uh, things that are going on in your day-to-day -day life right now, uh, being played out sometimes uh, directly or sometimes usually metaphorically. Um, uh, but there's also an extension of this, and that's that's called life after death. This is also a dream. Uh, and people talk about the astral plane, the mental plane, the causal plane, various dimensions and divisions and all this kind of stuff. Also dreams. Uh, they, they seem very real when you're in them, but they're also dreams. So when one leaves the body, they don't immediately enter into heaven. They'll certainly enter into more awareness because they don't have the obstacles in the way, and, and there would be counseling from other dreamers that they may have known in the past, such as family and friends, this lifetime and others, also dreamers from dreams and in a dream. Um, and, uh, and that is also a dream, a continuation of a dream. You could call it a rest period in many cases, and some of them will actually go into hospitals if they've died, if their physical body has died traumatically, dream hospitals. Um, uh, they'll go into schools where they have uh, dream schooling uh, that helps to uh, expand awareness. Uh, but inevitably uh, and invariably, they will come back into another body, dream body for another dream experience uh, until they are completely free um, and have remembered who they are as the God they are or the self they are. Uh, then there's no necessity, no uh, involuntary necessity to come back. You can come back, but but it's voluntary. So those are three dream states, um, and they're all basically the same. The next question is from Layla, who wants to know, lately, detaching from the body and being an observer is getting easier and almost effortless. But I noticed I started consciously avoiding this when I'm around things that the false self doesn't like. Uh, when I'm involved in situations that are not pleasant for it. Is this something that false self is using to stay out of the fire and escape? Okay. Um, this is most definitely what's going on. Um, I've mentioned uh, uh, many, many times that when one surrenders, it has to be no matter what. This was the choice that I had before I even knew about it. Uh, self-inquiry, um, which is the flip side of surrender. Um, I, I chose to let go of everything or surrender everything for freedom. I called it freedom. I didn't know I was surrendering. I just said, I'll do anything. And 
no matter what, I always add no matter what to that, means that you will do anything to be free. Standing in the fire of who you are not is basically what's occurring then. Because what happens is your conditioning will come up frequently and fast, much faster and much more frequently than it did before because now you're willing to look at it. You're willing to feel it. You're willing to question it. And um, the deeper you go, the more quickly the, the house of cards falls apart. The house of cards of conditioning falls apart. So there comes points uh, in that what looks like a process, but isn't really now, it's all happening now, but let's call it a process. There comes points where some things are really, really difficult to look at, really difficult to uh, experience, to say, this is not who I am. Um, and yes, it's, it's a way that the conditioning or the false self, which thinks that it's real, is trying to pull you back into the dream. Um, and this is why the no matter what choice to be free, if you use the word freedom, or to awaken, or to be enlightened, or whatever you want to call it. Um, this is why it's so important uh, to have an absolute resolution, a number one priority. This is where my life is now, and everything else supports that one choice to be free. Um, because when it comes to some of these, um, that's why it's called a fire, some of these fiery situations where you're facing who you're not, your conditioning, uh, you might turn back, you might hesitate, uh, and that can keep you in, in the dream the rest of your life and into other lifetimes. So the, the, the total resolution has got to be there. You can't play lip service to this. You have to be, as I was talking with uh, Anne earlier, you have to be ruthlessly authentic with yourself when you say, I choose freedom no matter what, because you will, I guarantee you, be test tested with this fire um, uh, that is in this question. Um, and you have to stand, stand in it. This is happening right now. Many people that are at the stage where they know that this is a dream, not just believe it's a dream, uh, that are sitting in the audience with baggage or, or echoes, um, they're experiencing right now incredible fire um, uh, as the conditioning now has this opportunity in this perfect uh, fertile environment for dissolving, for disappearing. So it's a wonderful but incredibly difficult uh, phase um, uh, that's happening for many, many people that have already made the choice and are at this freedom with baggage or echo stage. Um, and you just have to stand in it. You have to stay in it. There's nothing wrong with asking for help. Uh, you're only asking yourself. It's only the self asking the self for help. Nothing wrong with this. Call it angels. Call it guides. Call it whatever you want. But it's actually just the self. There is only the self. Um, that you're asking for um, endurance, let's say. Um, and, and this can be endurance uh, regarding uh, physical pain. Uh, some people have chronic pain that's it's, uh, almost unendurable, but they endure. Uh, nothing wrong with asking for help, and there's nothing wrong with going out and using different modalities, uh, physical modalities, to, to assist with this. Whatever helps. And then was talking about meditation before, which is an extremely good method of narrowing focus down to one pointedness, which makes self inquiry and surrender so much easier. Um, what, whatever feels joyful always is the monitor. Whatever feels joyful to you uh, in your protestless or, or um, pathless path, as I call it, then uh, embrace that and use it to, to uh, assist you. Uh, in the standing in the fire of who you're not surrender. I'm going to go over to Anonymous, who says, thank you for sharing your love, knowledge, and wisdom with us. Everything you talk about, I resonate with. Uh, Anonymous has a few questions, so I'll just uh, start with the first one. Is nothingness same as oneness? Right. Um, you'll hear the word uh, nothingness or emptiness. Well, uh, what does that mean? Um, it certainly means uh, oneness uh, because, uh, and, and take the ness off, but just say one. It means one. One is empty. Uh, but also one is all that is, whatever is projected. Uh, and that can include um, circumstances which are not necessarily visible, but they play out. Uh, things and circumstances and things which are in the process, so-called process, of incubating 
uh, to become a thing or, or an experience. Um, so uh, emptiness is also fullness. It's both. Um, and um, uh, nothing is, is another word for it. Um, and this is why uh, you hear the phrase, you need to die before you die. Well, who is it that's dying? The false self, which is made up of conditioning, expectations, identities, identifications, attachments tied to memory and imagination. This is what makes up the false self. And it's definitely not empty. And, and in the sense of being full, it's full of itself in the sense of arrogance, uh, even though it might be insecure. Uh, there's an arrogance to believing that I am a person. But you're definitely not a person. You're definitely not human. Um, you're playing at it, but you're not. You're, the, you're God. You're the self, period. There is nothing else. Um, so, yes, uh, uh, emptiness or oneness uh, and, and oneness or nothingness are the same. Anonymous's second question is, is enlightenment when a person realizes that the self is experiencing itself in the many and that it requires detachment. Hmm. Well, that's uh, that's only a, a small part of it. Detachment or the lack of attachments. Um, you can have things, but you're not attached to them. You don't have to give up everything. I did, but but that was just me. That was my pathless path. Uh, usually, the willingness to give up everything or be detached from everything that you have in your experience has to be there. That doesn't mean you necessarily are going to have to give up anything. You probably will, but you don't have to necessarily do that. Um, so, yes, the self is experiencing um, itself as uh, many others, and it knows that that experience is an illusion. Um, that state of awareness exists uh, in the state of enlightenment or the awareness of the self. Um, but there are many, many more facets to it than the, the simple awareness uh, that you've been playing in a dream uh, and that it's not real. Um, uh, many more facets than um, being detached from the dream. As I said a moment ago, um, all expectations have to go. All identifications have to go. Uh, all concepts of, of the past have to go. All concepts of the future have to go. Uh, you're living in the moment spontaneously clinging to nothing and not relying on any knowledge um, that you have because uh, even though the knowledge might show up in the moment, um, the knowledge is all made up by the false self and it's always less than perfect. And the self always functions in perfection spontaneously in the moment. Can to continue with Anonymous, uh, sometimes I find it hard to surrender. What does it mean? Okay, well, we, we just talked about that uh, before, but I'll say it again, that, that when uh, one is um, faced with, let's say, an attachment, the attachment might be a spouse, it could be someone that you're very close, it could be a pet, um, hell, it could be uh, an automobile, you, know, you, you might be in love with automobiles, um, it could be some uh, business that you've built and you're in love with it, it's your whole life or it's been your whole life. There's all kinds of things you can be attached to. And surrendering that attachment, not necessarily letting it go, but surrendering that attachment to that thing or those things can be extremely difficult. Well, this is a trigger. And thankful. Be thankful for it. Because the trigger is showing you something that is imprisoning you. Uh, you can be the head, the CEO of a multi-billion dollar corporation and not be attached to it. Not be attached to whether it goes up in the stock market or, or, or it falls flat as a pancake the next day and, and goes out of business. Um, that doesn't mean that you don't care, that you're indifferent. It just means that it's not molesting you. It's not controlling you. So this uh, surrender is definitely tied to many, many strings and threads that are intertwined into the puppet that you have been while you were sleeping. And... Um, uh, all conditioning must be dissolved. This is not letting it go. That's a totally different thing. You're not letting it go. Who, who is it that would be letting it go? There is, there is no one to let it go. 
uh, it has to be dissolved. It has to go back into the state of nothingness. And this happens through total surrender and or ideally self-inquiry, which is, you know, the direct route to freedom. Hmm. Last question from Anonymous. Is it possible to stay in the state of oneness at all times? Okay, this is this is a question that, that uh, uh, the false self uh, most definitely has uh, frequently. Gee, if I get there, am I going to fall out of it? Okay, well, we've talked about freedom uh, with baggage. And when you're free with baggage, you're free with conditioning. You know unequivocally in the heart, which means the self, that this is a dream. It's not real. You know it. You don't believe it. You know it. But you still have baggage. And the baggage will pull you back onto the stage of dreams where you will forget that it's a dream in the moment. Or you might actually remember it's a dream, but you're caught because the baggage, the conditioning is so strong. Um, so uh, in that case, you're not enlightened. You're free, but you're not enlightened. Self-realization is when you have no conditioning at all. And um, so, yes, it's very possible in the state of freedom with baggage or, or echoes or any, any conditioning to uh, go back and forth, to be wishy-washy. It's, it's less possible when there's just a whisper here or there of, uh, of conditioning. Um, but when you are enlightened, it, it is not possible to not be enlightened. Now, let's make a very strong point. You are enlightened now. You have never not been enlightened ever, ever suggests time. There's never been a moment in the dream of time and space that you have not been enlightened. But you, as the self, have forgotten that you're enlightened. So it's like the sun is in the sky. There's clouds in front of the sun, but the sun is still there. Sun meaning enlightenment, meaning you. Enlightenment and you are one and the same thing. You, the self doesn't have enlightenment. The self is, is just self-aware. Um, but the clouds can make you feel like you're not enlightened. Or even to some extent, if it's totally overcast, uh, you, meaning anyone in humanity, may not even be aware of what enlightenment is. They may not have a clue what it means. They just believe that they are a person uh, navigating in a very difficult, maybe even cruel world that they have no control over. In truth, you don't have any control either. You have no such thing as free will or control. Both of those are, are dreams. They're very true in the dream, but they're not real in reality. So um, that's the difference. And uh, and so when, when one is self-aware or so-called enlightened, they're never not again. It doesn't happen. It's really interesting. Um, I just want to add one little comment. I had a shaman friend of mine visit me yesterday, and he said that free will was freeing will. <laughs> he said that's your gift in humanity is to free will. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I, I, we're right at the end here, so I'll just yeah. uh, come back on. Um, that's a play on words, which is it's, it's cute. Um, but that suggests that you have control, that you have the ability to free your will, will as if you had it. Uh, there is only one will, uh, and that is the one purpose, and that is to be free. And there is only one purpose for everyone who sleeps in the dream, uh, and that is to awaken to the truth that you are freedom itself. You are the self. You are the I am. You are consciousness. That's the only purpose anyone has despite the many purposes people feel I have a special calling in life, this special purpose. No, you don't. You may have activity and it may seem extremely important, but that's just an attachment. You have only one purpose and that is to be free. If you happen to be still be involved in that activity after you're free, you could call that a purpose. Um, but generally speaking, your only purpose in remaining here is to be uh, a lighthouse uh, to the rest of the sleepers which of course is just aspects of the self. So there's only one will and that's God's will, your will, your, the real you, and that is freedom. This is really just deep stuff. <laughs> yeah, and yet simple. It's what I call C-spot run. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. I dig yeah. it. It's really, really good. Thank you so much, John, for, yeah. for everything. And um, thank you, everyone, for being with us today. Yeah. We'll, we'll be back next week. Yes. We, we think. Same time, same We likely station. will be back next week. <laughs> same time. Okay. Lots of love, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Bye.